Do you, given what we've seen in pricing since you reopened, now four days into it, uh, a move down by 15% or so, but approaching the Shanghai price, do you think that we're now through the short squeeze? Do you think we're going to head into a period of normal, more normal trade? Yeah, I think certainly the fact that we've gone limit down for the for, for the last four days uh, does suggest that, uh, that that clearly that the, the price had been inflated by that short squeeze, uh, and it is now logical with the situations around that squeeze having been resolved uh, that we would come down to a more normalised level. Uh, and obviously, the Shanghai price is is a good a good guide there. Uh, you know, today we'll be, be trading down into the uh, you know with the limit uh, ability to go down into the the, the 26,000s, uh, and I think there is a, a good chance that we'll discover a price uh, over the next couple of days, possibly even today. Good morning, Matthew. So you've now had a couple of weeks to consider what's been a pretty hectic situation. What do you think you went wrong? And I know there are many counterparties involved, but I specifically want to pin you down to what do you think the LME did wrong or could have done better? Yeah, so, so I think yeah, we, we've clearly been been dealing with the with the immediate challenge, uh, and uh, there's going to be a, a lot of time for us to to reflect on the lessons learned. But but I think that there's a few points that I would make. You know, the first is how this squeeze, uh, how this position was allowed to to arise, uh, and, and I certainly think that we need to look more closely again uh, at, at oversight of the OTC markets because clearly this is an issue that came from the OTC markets uh, and then. Uh, in impacted the exchange. Uh, then, mm. as has been well publicized, we have had challenges in delivering uh, our price limit. So, so in order to bring the market back to normality, we needed to make technical changes to our systems to allow to, to limit the price going down on each day. And that's not something that the LME has ever done before. Uh, and we worked uh, very quickly to bring in that price limit technology. Uh, and we, we clearly ran at that hard so that we could get the market reopened. Uh, there have been some, some well-publicized um, uh, you know, glitches, which I don't think have made a difference to the fact that we just went limit down each day, but clearly have been embarrassing for the LME. Yeah. And again, that, that's what happens when you have to deliver okay. these things at speed to reopen the market. Matthew, can I ask you more about that OTC question? So the way this seemed to work is that this, the, 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 the Sing Shan's positions were held over the counter uh, in bilateral short positions between it and its banks. But then the banks then held positions with you. And so the exact size of this big short position was not necessarily entirely transparent. Do you think a specific bank, JP Morgan in this case, knew more and should have told the market more about the size of this short position? Or do you think banks in general should have? Yeah, I, I don't really want to talk about any specific bank because, as I say, there'll, there'll be a lot of work to do after uh, we the, the price uh, re returns to a normal level and, and free trading resumes uh, to look into all the specific details. But I certainly think it's true to say that we need to, to really look at that OTC market to be able to identify where there is systemic risk, where there are perhaps clients who have positions across a number of dealers, and the impact that that is having on the exchange market. So we'll be looking both at the specifics of what happened here, but also that general question that we have raised a few times in the past about how should the OTC market uh, be, be overseen given its potential impact on the listed market. OK, so Matthew, so you think it seemed to imply that a large part of the blame goes to the OTC market. But of course, as you say, there was also some technical issues from the, on the LME side. Um, can you categorically assure users of the LME that you're never again going to cancel hours of trades just because you don't really like the price that's been transacted at? And if you can't categorically assure investors of that, that there won't be some other exceptional reason, why should investors return to the LME en masse? Yeah, I absolutely understand that, that we have a lot of work to do to, to rebuild trust uh, with, with those investors, uh, and that's going to take, take time and effort. I think that the obvious thing that, that I would point out is that we have now put the price limits in place. That, that's not something that our market ever really wanted or, or, or embraced before, but, but I think this incident demonstrates that we have to have price limits. So there are now 15% up and down price limits daily on all of our 
our metals, uh, all of our physically delivered metals, not just nickel. Uh, and so that, I think, is a first step in saying that because we have those price limits, the need to mm. ever do this again should not be there because the, the market will mm. simply limit out. Uh, and so that, that's a good first example of something that we can say to the community uh, that should prevent this ever happening again. OK, uh, you've said a number of times that this has nothing to do with your, the way you handled this crisis, Matthew, had nothing to do with the fact that uh, Xinxian is a Chinese company and they are owned by uh, a Hong Kong business. But there'll be some who won't be necessarily convinced by that. Can you see that uh, it, can you can you see a path forward that in order to convince those who use your services of your independence, that maybe it is uh, it's going to be necessary for Hong Kong to sell your business for you to be owned by somebody else? Yeah, well, look, that, that, I'm not going to, I can't talk to, to, to Hong Kong Exchange's intentions except to say that Hong Kong Exchange have, I think, been uh, and are an extremely supportive uh, shareholder and parent of the LME. They have invested huge amounts uh, into, uh, into our business, into our modernization, uh, and, and they have, I think, been a hugely supportive owner for the market. So uh, I think it would be a shame to discount all of those good things that, that have been done simply because there is this suggestion uh, of Chinese influence, particularly since, as I've said before, I, I simply haven't seen that. Right? You know, we, we were talking about a very large Chinese client, but, but that's perhaps not surprising given the importance of China in the global metals markets. If there is to be a big client, there is a very strong probability that they're going to be Chinese. And just to re-emphasize, the reason we intervened was not because of the nationality of, of, of the, the client, it was because of the size and the systemic impact to the client, and we would have done that whatever their nationality. Okay, that's a, that's a reasonable explanation, Matthew, and you say this is a systemic situation. What do you say to the individual trader who was bullish nickel, rode the market all the way up, and looked to take profits on March 8th, thought they'd made a load of money, may have already invested that money elsewhere, done something else that money, or kind of leveraged it up, uh, and then suddenly those trades are cancelled. Does that trader deserve compensation? And if so, who should be paying that compensation? Yeah. So, so I absolutely understand the, the very real anger uh, which exists from, from people who, who have found themselves in that situation. As I say, we, our focus has been on stabilizing the market, uh, restoring the market, the nickel market, to, to a place where there is a valid price for the physical industry. The decisions we made uh, were, we believe, the right decisions to, to avoid some very negative consequences in terms of uh, a totally uh, disconnected price, in terms of the impact that that would have had on, on many parties. But, but I, I don't want to underestimate the uh, the understandable uh, anger uh, and, and as I say the next step for us is to now uh, review how this has happened review the decisions look at the lessons mm. learned uh, and we will absolutely uh, make sure that those questions are addressed you say the best uh, the best path forward for, for us Matthew you are supposed to be leaving the LME fairly soon can you update us on your plans are you still uh, are you still supposed to be leaving at the end of April to take on a new job which would be understandable or are you under pressure to stay until this has been sorted out well, I'm uh, certainly around for, for, for another month until the end of April. There is an awful lot that we'll be able to do uh, together in, in that time. And, and my focus is on doing everything I can for the time that I'm here uh, to, to help address what has been uh, an extremely challenging situation for everyone in our market. Matthew, there's one final question. Everyone cares about Russia, Ukraine. That's obviously related to what happened in the nickel squeeze in the first place. Are you comfortable that a Russia metals company could today or tomorrow sell a bunch of metals on your exchange and receive a lot of money for that? Um, is that something you're comfortable with? And do you plan to do something about that? Yeah, so, so, so obviously looking at the, the horrific scenes in, in Ukraine, uh, I don't think, um, you know, I don't think anybody can, can ignore um, that, that question. Uh, and you know, we obviously uh, are, are, are deeply concerned about, about, the, about the situation in, in Ukraine. And we want to make sure that, that the LME can't be part of, uh, of, of financing, uh, you know, any type of atrocity of, of that nature. So, so th there is this challenge for commodities exchange 
changes that if we ban metal from our warehouses, we're not just making a decision mm. about our business, we're making a decision on behalf of the whole market. And so commodities exchanges have uh, really always followed the government position on sanctions because we need to have that democratic mandate for what is and isn't acceptable. Right now, okay. Russian metal isn't sanctioned, and that's why it's allowed in, but we are absolutely working with government to communicate the concerns of the market, and we'll see where that goes.